I was browsing Steam the other day, berating myself for missing out on so many games in the Steam sale, when this popped up. Stranger Things 3 The Game. Interesting, I didn't see any releases for the first two seasons, but here we are, what appears to be an isometric game mimicking the season, created by Bonus XP. Mm, their back catalogue isn't the most compelling, but things might have improved. Now, you're probably aware that I adore isometric games. There was something about seeing those early isometric titles on the ZX Spectrum that ignited my brain cells. Being able to navigate around a seemingly three-dimensional world was captivating stuff which excited my senses and fired my soul. Over 30 years have passed since then, with each decade offering its own twists on the isometric perspective, but I still can't shake that original feeling from the 80s. Isometric games just feel right to me, they feel like a video game should feel. And so Stranger Things 3, combined with its systemic 80s vibe, was a surefire purchase. Rather than the PC, however, I opted for the Switch version, because holding an isometric world somehow feels more compelling than viewing it at a distance. From the go, we're enveloped in the familiar, yet pixelated version of the Stranger Things universe, although this is closer to a 16-bit game in terms of visuals and sound than you might expect from an 80s 8-bit release. Let's dive straight in. We're offered three difficulty levels, named Story, Standard and Master. Story mode is really just easy mode. They've named it Story because it allows you to appreciate the story without really facing any threats. So I'll stick with Standard. Now, I wouldn't say that spoilers are really coming up, but the game does roughly follow the plot of the season. However, I'll try not to give away anything groundbreaking. We begin with a cutscene depicting the events at the start of episode 1, just in a more condensed fashion. Seriously, I think I'd prefer it if the show took this very short and direct approach. I could watch the entire season in half an hour. Mike and Lucas then find themselves in the Star Court Mall, or Mall, with a baseball bat and a slingshot. A large part of the game is just smashing the living crap out of items in order to uncover cash or useful commodities. This is a universe where burgers explode to reveal cash. Sounds like my sort of universe. Handily, policing in this area is pretty slack, and nobody around you has a problem with this approach. I presume David Harbour is busy being the mayor in Final Fight. So, our first objective is to get into the cinema screening for Day of the Dead. We do this by visiting Steve, who unlike the show, has lost his keys. Smashing some boxes seems to do the trick, and then we can move on, taking a similar approach of finding people with an issue, solving their problem, and then obtaining the means to continue forth. It's an RPG light at its core. There are lots of side rooms along the way where you can smash into lockers, for example, and steal everyone's money, or just open all the fridges and cookers, because, you know, apparently global warming is just a giant hoax. But soon enough, you complete your goal and move the plot along. Mike's basement is essentially our base, and from here we must engage in various quests, although the order we do this is often left to you. I'm easily distracted, so I spend a lot of time smashing random objects up to gain items, and it's hugely compelling. I mean, I'm literally smashing the crap out of my own house here. Cash is useful for buying things like energy replenishing cola from vending machines, whilst other objects can be used to make weapons or essential quest items, so it does pay to look around. Most quests involve going from one place to another, and either triggering switches or collecting items, but it's not as tedious as it sounds. There's a reasonable degree of variation along the way, and things to look at. Like this creepy guy just staring at the pool. Or these guys, who despite harbouring a frosty attitude, are completely ambivalent to you smashing the living crap out of their boxes. 
you also get basic puzzles like these pressure pads requiring you to switch between characters and move them into position. We also need certain skills to unlock certain areas. Some of these are obtained through unlocking further characters. Dustin can hack doors for example, whilst also being able to spray people at a distance with a never ending aerosol can. And being the 80s that's clearly not even CFC free. In 1974, the United States banned the use of fluorocarbons in hopes of curbing the problem. Fluorocarbon sprays are still legal in most of Europe. Okay, so maybe if it was set in Europe it wouldn't be. It appears America was ahead of the curve on this one. Man, what glorious days. Anyway, there's certainly enough here to keep you engaged, and what's more, it's done in this detailed and compelling isometric perspective. This game really reminds me of Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters, both in the light puzzle solving and frantic arcade style fights you can find yourself in. When you do come up against foes, blocking is essential, as is correct choice of weapon. Mike's baseball bat is very powerful, but it doesn't have the range of Lucas's slingshot or Dustin's spray can, so it pays to pick your tactics wisely. Each character also has special abilities, such as the bombs Lucas can use to blast through rocks. It's not mindless, that's the key here. It also deviates enough from the season plot to keep you interested, whilst not breaking key plotline elements. It feels a lot like the best arcade games of the 90s in that respect. Robocop springs to mind, as does the Turtles arcade game, both incorporating stories from their originating show but in a slightly shaken, gamified way, with room for creative deviance. There are some nice superficial points to the game, like Billy's car being parked outside the swimming pool at opportune moments, or using the computer text adventure in Dustin's house. It's very short, but still quite fun to interact with. This could have been a game which was terribly implemented and really put out to make a quick buck, but I'm honestly enjoying it so far. I'm only a few hours in, and from what I can tell, there's quite a few hours left to go, so I feel for the £15 price tag, my money has been pretty well spent. When you do complete the game, you unlock an extra mode called Eliminator. Hmm, sounds aggressive. What is it? Well, this is where the entire group is unlocked from the get-go, but if anyone happens to die, then that's it. Permadeath. This could lead to you being unable to progress past certain points, but then you've already completed it by now, so, you know, there's no biggie. Also, it's a nice touch. I like it. Another nice touch is the local two-player mode, where your friend, or enemy if you prefer, takes control of the second character. It wasn't immediately obvious that this was even a feature, but fire up a second controller and another player can jump in and out as they please. Interestingly, rather than both being on the same screen, like Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters or even the Chaos Engine, bonus XP have gone with a split-screen mode. This allows you to wander off to different areas, but it also makes finding each other again a nuisance. It would be nice if there were arrows pointing you back to your co-op friend, but I think it actually would have been best just left as a single screen. Whoa, I'm telling well, you found the bloody way, rocks! Then. Jesus Christ! Christ! You're in the way of some explodey things. Okay. Expect to get If you were in real life, would you just lob a yes. bomb at your mate's head? Yes! You'd do that, would you? Well, yes, if they're not getting out well, of the you way. You didn't even give a warning, you I just lobbed a bomb. I wouldn't out with the kind of people who wouldn't know to get out of the way. Still, it's a welcome addition and certainly adds fun to proceedings. Outside of two-player mode, I do have some other niggles, however. The first are these message boxes. They can often interrupt you in the middle of action or at just unfortunate moments. This would be okay if they just appeared in the corner, but they don't. They interrupt and pause the game, and it's annoying. Often items like hearts actually seem to disappear when it's paused as well, so it doesn't seem to pause the whole game. Also, loading times are by no means long, but having so many of these breaks when moving from one room to another can interfere with immersion. It doesn't happen every time, but some areas you presume to be flowing need to be loaded in. Now, this isn't really a niggle, but it's interesting how NPCs are often quite 
quite mindless. I mean, what's this lass doing, literally pacing back and forth over and over? Oh, yes, yes she is. So what do I think overall? Well, this is a game that's compelling, it's nostalgic, and really, although it closely follows the season, it's playable in its own right, especially on the Switch's casual handheld format. You could even choose to play this before watching the show, and due to its arcade style and rapid direct storytelling, probably wouldn't ruin your viewing experience. Although it's probably best if you play it alongside the show, it gives you that slight immersiveness that you may well be craving, but which TV just lacks. Of course, it's not all rosy. If you're seeking that 80s nostalgia hit that the show serves up so effortlessly, then you're likely to be disappointed. Although the game graphics could be placed in the late 80s, there isn't that much in the universe itself that screams out your favourite decade. It's not utterly engrossing or deep, but then you wouldn't expect that. For this reason, some may find it pretty boring and repetitive, but I think it's pretty fun and lightly engaging for those moments when you want to dive into something, but can't, you know, really be asked. That's my kind of thing, generally in life, and so I'm more than happy to sink another handful of hours into it. Although it does upset me slightly having to pulverise these rats so often, but at least they're evil rats who are soon to face an even more grisly fate. And, you know, the baseball bat offers a satisfying solution, so in that respect, it's okay. If you've got a Switch, you like isometric games, and you like Stranger Things, then I'd recommend picking this up. It seems like a good game to play on the go. Or you could just play Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters, because now I've played this, I want to go back and play that. Win-win. Thanks for watching, have a great evening.